Thank you for taking time today to join us for this panel discussion. My name is Kelly Cape. I am wearing a blue dress, a very fake pearl necklace, and my hair is curled. I'm sitting in front of my childhood living room with a tree to my left. I am the Entertainment and Media Fellow at Respectability, a nonprofit fighting stigmas and advancing opportunities so people with disabilities can fully participate in all aspects of community. I identify as bisexual, and my pronouns are she, they. If you would like to view the ASL interpreter in a larger screen, we invite you to pin their video, which will spotlight their video throughout the entire panel. In addition, we have live captioning done by a real life person, and this is available in the Zoom app by clicking on the CC button, as well as via your web browser. And we've posted that link in the chat box below. This panel is live and we'll be taking questions from you during the second half of the panel. Please add your questions to the Q&A box to do so. And if you're watching us on Facebook during the live airing, we'll be monitoring for questions there as well. This panel is being recorded and will be available on Respectability's Facebook page and website after the event concludes. A high resolution recording with open captions and our ASL interpreters will be posted and sent to everyone who's registered next week. If you wanna stay reconnected to Respectability, I invite you to sign up for our weekly newsletter on disability inclusion and equity in the entertainment industry. Check out the link in the chat box to do so. In celebration of Pride Month, we are discussing LGBTQ plus representation in media to highlight best practices in folks living at the intersection of being queer and disabled, and what that means working in media as we strive for better and more equitable representation of this intersectional identity. According to a recent study from the Movement Advancement Project, an estimated three to five million LGBTQ people are currently living with disabilities. Queer individuals face a disproportionately higher unemployment rate than people without disabilities, a stat that is perpetuated even further during COVID. And 26% of LGBTQ students were bullied or harassed at school because of an actual or perceived disability. Evidently, our society still has miles to go to empower our communities fully and equitably. And I believe entertainment and media has a big role in that. Before we dive in, I'd like to formally allow our expert panelists to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about their journey. Before you answer though, please describe yourself. For example, the one I did earlier, I'm Kelly, I'm wearing a blue dress, fake pearls in my childhood living room, and then give your answer. Shay, would you like to start us off? Yes, I do, but uh, I don't know how I'm gonna be able to, I don't know how uh, um, I'd be able to follow that act, but uh, so I'm Shay Marzai, I'm an Iranian American, I'm gay, and I'm also, I'm also, um, she's a person who stutters. Um, I'm sitting she's, 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 um, she's in my apartment. I'm wearing just a dark blue shirt. I have a pair of, uh, 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 I have a pair of, just, of eyeglasses and hair that is uh, she's, 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 uh, short and alarmingly going gray. Um, she's, 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 I'm a screenwriter. I'm she's, she's, uh, 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 I'm she's a producer as well. Uh, she's, 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 I'm the CEO of a Space Coyote. Um, I'm repped uh, at Zero Gravity uh, and APA, and uh, I'm really excited to be here. We are happy to have you, and Shay, I love the gray. It looks very flattering on you. Uh, Eric, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Eric. Um, it's fun being actually speaking on this panel because I usually run the tech only. Um, so I'm a communications associate here at Respectability. I'm wearing a gray shirt with respectability logo on it. I have short hair and glasses and I'm in front of a white wall. My pronouns are he, him, and his. And um, as I'm both gay and on the autism spectrum, it's good to be with all of you here to talk about intersectionality and to celebrate Pride Month 2021. Thank you so much, Eric. Eric is truly the pride and joy of respectability and I have so many tech problems. I couldn't have made it here without him today. So thank you so much. Kai, would you like to go next? Absolutely. Hi, I'm Kaya Amara. My pronouns are they, she. Uh, I am wearing a blue suit coat and uh, repping my National Disability Theater shirt. 
Uh, I'm sitting in my room in New York City, which there's currently a thunderstorm outside. So if you see flashing lights or hear loud booming, that's because we are in the middle of a thunderstorm. And I'm surrounded by some plants and a bookshelf and all of my lovely favorite things. Uh, I am also queer and disabled. Everybody said it, so now I feel like I should too. Happy Pride, everybody. Uh, and I am the founder of Indie Visible, um, which is a production group that focuses mostly on making accessibility accessible uh, in indie films. So we do a bunch of stuff for production, pre through post, um, as well as making our own films. And yeah, super excited to be here as well. Thank you so much. I felt like everyone pinned your video the second you said thunderstorms and everyone's just going to be watching looking for lightning. So thank you. Facebook, keep an eye out for that. Uh, Nesreen, would you like to introduce yourself next? Hey, my name is Nesreen. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Uh, my body is currently occupying Tongva land. I'm multi-heritage. I um, have long curly brown hair that's um, currently styled in a long braid. I'm sitting in a gray chair. And I'm wearing a black Lost Boys t-shirt. I have seven identities. I have six disabilities, five of which are in, uh, invisible. I'm neurodiverse. I have chronic pain um, and I walk with a cane sometimes. I create content for film and TV behind the camera. Uh, I'm a screenwriter and cinematographer. Thank you so much for that introduction. I should also disclose too that I have a very long list of mental disabilities, uh, the top of which are PTSD and anxiety and depression. So thank you for being vulnerable and sharing all of your identities with us. That's such an important part of this discussion. Uh, Lenny, would you like to go next? Sure, of course. I'm Lenny Larson. Um, I am, uh, I'm a spinal cord injury victim, so I'm paralyzed from the neck down. Um, but that doesn't stop me from doing much of anything. I'm also gay, and uh, I run my own production company called Next Generation Creative Group. Um, we work on primarily content for kids and families, um, and we're getting ready to start our first feature over the summer. Um, I'm uh, wearing a dark charcoal brace shirt, um, and I'm in one of my home offices. Thank you so much for that introduction. Thank you all for being here and sharing your experiences with us today. To start things off, I am really excited to know from our panelists, uh, what examples of queer representation have you seen in film or television lately that you feel empowered by or you feel are authentic? I can take this one first. Um, so I'm gonna focus on, there's a lot of good queer representation and a lot of good disability representation. There's not as much that is both at the same time. So I'm gonna pick two examples that are both at the same time. Um, first one is obviously special on Netflix, um, starring Ryan O'Connell um, and has lots of other people cameo uh, in it. And it's a fantastic show, very funny. Um, and Ryan is both gay and has cerebral palsy and he spoke at our event last year. Um, so he he's fantastic. And the show is definitely worth a watch. Um, the other example I'm gonna give is from the world of reality television, if anyone, knows me, I, I'm very interested in the reality competition shows. And um, so I wrote about Robert White, um, who is um, gay and autistic like me and um, finished as runner up on Britain's Got Talent in 2018 and he's a comedian and he was fantastic. So those are two examples I would recommend that people put out and check out, sorry. Absolutely, thank you so much for sharing those. I know special has been very trending on Netflix right now, just so great to see, especially because Top Down from Respectability is in it as well. So big shout out to her. Uh, does anyone else have any favorite examples I'd like to share? Yeah, um, um, I think it'd be cool for us to to uh, to uh, actually talk about just um, she's a multimedia property. Uh, it originally started off as a, a flagship series. Um, she's on Sony's PlayStation, so uh, she's, uh, uh, she's, I like The Last of Us a lot. It's actually being adapted into a, a similar 
flagship series uh, on HBO. And uh, uh, I like her for several reasons. Uh, I guess one being uh, I, I'm already like it's just, uh, it's just a huge nerd, so I fit in it's just, it's just exactly well with it. But uh, it's basically set in, in like a, a zombie apocalypse. But uh, but uh, it's just, um, it's just, I was most excited by the fact that uh, that she's just, uh, it's, just, um, its lead character is actually is actually a uh, uh, just. Uh, just uh, she's, just, um, she's a lesbian, but uh, just, I bring this up, and, and I think it answers uh, just a broader question for us all. Actually, is that uh, is that uh, just, if a character is written uh, uh, as being uh, just, uh, um, just a queer person, it doesn't mean that uh, it doesn't mean uh, his, hers, or, just, or their story it just has to only be about being just a queer person. So it's just, um, it's just, it broke a lot of ground. It, it, it got a, a, a sequel as well that also features uh, just, uh, it's just, uh, um, it's just, um, um, it's just, um, 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 it also features uh, it's just, um, it's just, um, it's just a trans character as well. And of course, it, it starts off like uh, a little bit of. Uh, uh, um, well, it's just, uh, it's just, I also just say that like it, 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 it's just, it's just, in stories like. It doesn't bite like uh, a little bit. It's just, it's just, it's just a, a backlash where uh, a, a, a small portion it's just, it's just like the audience is always saying, well, it's just, I don't want this pushed down my throat when it's not at all. It's a, a part of this person's identity. And I think she makes it's just, it's just a kick ass hero. So I love that so much, especially when someone's identity can just be not not the center of the plot it can just be more dimension to who they are um so thank you for sharing that perspective i'd love to hear from the rest of our panelists too and, and i have to agree with you i if i see one more coming out story i'm gonna have to <laughs> it's like it, it, it when when you're when you're representing queer characters on the screen it's it doesn't always have to be about coming out we're just normal people integrated with society and uh, and and those are the shows I tend to appreciate most. Thank you, Lenny. I think it's time that our community is pretty vocal about condoning the tropes and the overplayed plots that we're always seeing. So I am a huge advocate for more dynamic plot lines for the queer community as well. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that in Schitt's Creek as well. I think it's one of the earlier shows that kind of incorporated sexuality in a really fluid environment. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was it was a pretty awesome shoot. Does anyone else have any recommendations? I just saw a film on Hulu uh, directed by Natalie Morales called Plan B. Um, and what struck me was that uh, the two main characters are brown women, brown young girls. Um, and one of them is represented in the LGBTQ community. And um, I just love seeing that there was some intersection in that storyline. Thank you so much. And that's definitely a huge part of our panel today is not just a queer identity, but understanding that our community as a whole is distinctively intersectional. And that's something that is worth celebrating through not just this month, but through the whole year. And it's so great that we have all these characters to hold on to in these stories. And I can't wait to see what new content the post-COVID world uh, and post-COVID safe prediction production teams will be able to create moving forward. Uh, how can these sets in the casting process as a whole make the entertainment industry more accessible, a more accessible workforce? What do you think they should change moving forward? Well, I think the key to getting a more accessible workforce, both in front of the camera and behind the camera, it starts at the executive level. Um, there is that I can. I, there's one person I know who is on the executive level of any of the studios who's disabled, and uh, and that that's where it has to come from. Absolutely, it's all about taking advantage of those powerful seats at the table and using that privilege and that access for good and helping pioneer a driving force of diversity further. So thank you for that. Uh, Shay, I see your hand, would you like to share? Yeah, um, it's just, it's just, um, it's just, I just wanna follow up on that point because I think it's a, a fantastic one. And I'll, I'll, I'll speak a bit more about like, uh, 
about uh, uh, sh sh how things have changed recently. And uh, I wanted to point out, like, as awful as uh, our pandemic was and everything, like, it, 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 it did present a paradigm shift for the world. And, and I, I think it showed it was, like, the importance of accessibility. So if you look at a program this was like the one we're on right now, like uh, it allows people to be able to uh, to be able to work from home. So like if you're a wheelchair user, it eliminates accessibility issues like that. And uh, it really showed us that that a work from home shift, like uh, it really wasn't like a doomsday scenario that all, all of these major corporations um, have actually made it out to be. And I'm afraid, frankly, because now that uh, uh, um, it seems to be in a just just a rear view mirror, I know this is a I know that a lot of companies are, are insisting that uh, 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 that like a lot of people come back in and work from an office. I don't think it's necessary. I think it's a bad idea. But like again, it was a like it was a bad situation. But it, it did show that a, a lot of our preconceived notions about who can show up to work and not. This is. Um, we're very outdated. So I, I hope technology like this certainly stays in place. And uh, I don't see a reason like why it shouldn't. Absolutely. I really do think that the future of work is a hybrid model that's accessible to everyone. And it's a huge bummer that it took a pandemic to shine this light of accessibility and this opportunity to help everyone uh, put to work the best way that they can possible. Um, but hopefully moving forward, we keep those modes of accessibility open and thriving for all of us. I even found myself using being able to take social breaks to recharge and have some alone time. Uh, that just helped my all of my depression so much through the pandemic was being able to really reflect on myself and so I think that having a hybrid model is such a crucial part of moving forward. Uh, does anyone else want to share? Yeah I absolutely want to jump in after Shay just since he brought up this point of you know it wasn't until the pandemic affected everybody that then we had this thing of oh now let's try to make things accessible um, and I thought that was so I mean not surprising sadly but super interesting um, and I think something that a lot of times people don't think about, and especially, you know, execs when we come up with all these barriers of, you know, oh, we can't hire this di disabled person because they have an accessibility need, that accessibility and disability are the only things that are connected, instead of recognizing that accessibility is something that everybody needs, it's not intrinsically connected to the disability community, you know, whether it's somebody who, you know, is a person who is going through a pregnancy and needs time off for that, that's accessibility. Whether it's somebody who just like during COVID times, if somebody has a sick family member and needs to take off leave, that's accessibility. And we tend to look at it like it's too much when a disabled person asks for it, but when a non-disabled person asks for it, then it's fine. So I think one of the big changes that needs to happen as well is sort of this break of yes, recognizing that disability and access hugely go hand in hand, but also recognizing that those aren't the only two things that are connected. And so we really need to be focusing on access as a whole production aspect and as a whole holistic aspect of filmmaking, not just about disabled people, but about making all of our processes more accessible to everybody across the board whether it be during a pandemic or post-pandemic. Snaps all around to that, girlfriend. You got it right on the dot. That is just exactly the kind of voice and narrative we need to be amplifying that it shouldn't take a pandemic for our voice to be heard um, or a semblance of our voice. So you are absolutely so right there. Oh my goodness, thank you for sharing. Uh, does anyone else want to share on this topic of making entertainment more accessible? Yeah, I think, you know, there's there's stigma and there's so much fear around the fact that um, someone who's disabled who may come on set or may be in the writer's room will have too many needs or they'll be 
astronomical in terms of financial uh, financial impact on the budget, and that's just not the case. Um, I've seen time and time again on multiple sets where uh, positions above the line will start thinking about accessibility and the needs of their crew members, whether they're disabled or not, across the board and start to ask the right questions at the very beginning of pre-production to start to lay out what that schedule and that, um, that production is going to look like. Um, and when you have universal design on set, the content you're creating just becomes so, that much more valuable. The, the disability market is a trillion dollar market. You know, you can't just write disability storylines without the disability community. We have to be there. We have to be part of that fabric. Um, and if you want us to be part of that fabric and tell authentic stories, um, you have to welcome us into a space that, that, that we can actually work in. And it's and, not as hard, I think, as a lot of people might think it is. Um, and I have, I have to agree with you. All I need is a doorway I can fit through. And I can do my job as a director, as an, as an EP. I just need to get in the room. <laughs> I think it's that I think it's like just a matter of like breaking down this wall, this invisible wall that's, you know, been created about like this person has a disability and I'm and and the person who doesn't have the disability seems like it's such a huge mountain to climb over to reach them to collaborate with them and it's not. Um, it could be as simple as having um, pieces of paper and pen on different surfaces when someone who's deaf is on set. I mean, that's a really non-expensive way of including someone, creating a doorway or choosing a room that has a doorway that, that Lenny can fit through. That's, mm. not, that's not an astronomical ask. Those are <laughs> simple things. I'm gonna jump on one more time at the end of that, just because I so loved what Nazreen said about that idea of like, they think it's this crazy ask and it's really not. And I think, that's something that people in the disability community are really comfortable with doing out of necessity, which is saying, this is what I need in order to do my job. Here is the thing, which is really making it so much easier for execs. My sibling is also in the industry and told me this story about somebody else who was working on a feature and was super proud because they made it through this feature living off of Lucky Charms marshmallows and at the end they weighed 90 pounds. And that's not an accessible process then. Yes, that yes. person just isn't asking for the things that they need and act to actually make the process accessible. Not that that's on that person at all. Obviously there's tons of issues in the industry that continue to perpetuate that system. But I think that's something that's really scary to execs is that the disabled community comes in and just goes, actually, I need this. And there isn't any other way, as you, as Lenny said, I have to fit through the door. There you go. That's a need and you have to accept it if I'm the person who's going to be working here and I should be the person working here. <laughs> you know, like we're already asking people, we're finally at a point in history where we're asking people what pronouns they use on a daily basis, which is awesome. Um, and before that, we were asking people, you know, what dietary needs they have. So these are becoming kind of part of our everyday language. Why not add a third question? Is there anything that, you know, we can provide to help make your work possible? And that's not just asking someone who's disabled, that's asking everyone. Everyone has needs. Exactly. And that's something I've always kind of struggled with internally is this phrase special needs, where really the need to feel accepted and to have access to work isn't, isn't a special need. And it's, we all have accommodations that can be made to help make our lifestyles more healthier and accessible. So thank you for bringing up and thank you to everyone for chiming in so much. I really appreciate all of your input. These are such great ideas. Uh, once we finally have some sense of inclusive workspaces in the industry, it's always nice and always empowering to feel a sense of community. Have any of you felt or found a safe space in entertainment or media and have advice for others on how to build community, how to find community, 
and what that looks like. Yeah, um, 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 I would love to speak to this as a member. Of the Writers Guild of America West, and that um, it's always been a, 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 a part of our guild that uh, like there's certain subsets of specialized writers groups. So um, I myself sit on a, 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 our disabled writers committee. Our, our um, LGBTQ Writers Committee, and uh, as a, a shameless plug, uh, our recently launched uh, um, Middle Eastern Writers Committee. Uh, I want to talk about that one too, because it, uh, it's a bit, it's been about it's just a decade in the making, where uh, originally it actually wasn't a thing, like because we were deemed uh, um, a micro. <laughs> Minority, which uh, I, 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 I think that I think that in itself is like um, um, a really crazy term, but it does seem to be a thing of the past. In, in that uh, all all uh, uh, at least all of us. Uh, all of us, our different committees uh, are, are doing things that uh, are, 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 are raising awareness and uh, uh, um, visibility for its own members. But I also see a, a strong sense of solidarity as well. Like of all of these different groups are, just, are looking out for each other. So it, it, it seems like a, a, a bunch of um, just these different kind of safe spaces are, 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 are there, but uh, I'm blown away by the fact that they seem to all oh, just, uh, just, um, just, just all work so well together. Thank you so much for sharing that. You're right. This development of subcommittees and groups where we can meet like-minded individuals and like identified people is just so empowering to feel you not maybe not as different or not as alone. I know that there's a huge difference in diversity, equity, inclusion work where you have equality, you have equity, and then you have liberation. And one the first step is hiring diverse people. The second step is creating communities that break down barriers and can facilitate diverse interaction. And the last step is tearing down the wall that even separates the difference between minorities and majorities. And so you're right, taking that step to make committees where we can feel included and empowered is so important. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to share? Well, I mean, one thing I'd like to, I'd like to bring to the table is the diversity and inclusion positions that almost every major studio is putting in place right now. And if you really look at it, it's all cultural. It has nothing to do with disability. It has nothing to do with LGBT status. And, and it's, it, they're so focused on diversity and culture. And it really needs to be brought to their attention on both the committee level and on the executive level that diversity is so much larger than cultural. And that, that's something I've run into over and over again. And it's like, wait a second, no, it's not just cultural. Exactly, and I think a lot of that has to do with this very dangerous phenomenon of tokenism, where if you can't see the diversity uh, or the color of someone's skin, then it doesn't count as diversity. And it's we're in such a strong era where that's expanding and corporations are starting to listen and change. And I think that this process of coming out that we all experience uh, as queer people is also part of the intersection with disability, where do we disclose our non-visible disability? Um, it's this, this idea of disclosure and the dangers that come with that. And I was just wondering, in the leads perfectly to my next question, Lenny, is that with, with this idea of coming out, has anyone ever navigated this disclosure dissonance that comes with both disability and sexual identity in a way that's been 
celebratory or a really healthy environment. Does anyone want to share their story or journey with that? So I'll go first on this one. Um, so I actually came out much later than I than I would have liked um, because because of the stigma of autism. Um, so in high school, I knew I was gay. In like ninth grade, I knew. I didn't come out to anyone until 12th grade and I didn't come out to most people until college um, because there are lots of like, there are, I was bullied and I wrote about this a couple of years ago for respectability. Um, and so I was afraid that I was already being bullied for being different, read autistic. And I didn't want to add to that by also being openly gay. And I feel like it's a huge problem that um, people are afraid to come out because of the stigma and because I, I, it's becoming less of a problem, thankfully, but it is still a problem and it's still something that needs to be addressed. So. Well, every, every time you fill out a job application somewhere, it's like, do I click the I have a disability button or do I not? Exactly. Yeah, uh, um, I think that's a, 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 a fantastic point too. And I just wanted to say this as well. Like uh, I first started out here, like uh, I worked at a, a mini major studio. I got hired on as a, an unpaid intern. I don't wanna be that guy, but I kicked ass there. So uh, just, uh, just, I eventually got hired, but uh, I, just, I did hear that like, like there were whispers coming out of HR that I couldn't be hired because, uh, just, because uh, just, um, just, I couldn't work the phones. Uh, but uh, 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 um, and it brings up like uh, like one of those adages where I had to work uh, um, I had to work uh, uh, just, uh, just, uh, I had to work uh, just, um, just, um, just, um, just a lot harder just, uh, just, uh, just in order to prove myself, which I did. Uh, I went to, I ran uh, just our studio story department. I stayed there for uh, for uh, just, um, just, um, just, um, just over six and a half years. But I, I do want to say like the fact that uh, I worked in an, in, 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 in um, <clears throat> I work in an environment like that where uh, as many as um, you can imagine, I heard things like, oh, just like just all these homophobic comments and stuff. So I didn't want to tell people I was gay. And then it's just, uh, just at the same time, uh, as ironic as, just, as it sounds, because uh, it's very obvious I stutter, uh, I didn't want to tell people that I had just, just, uh, just, just a speech impediment like this. So uh, it has been, um, it's just an uphill battle. I I, I have had a, a, um, um, a rep in the past who actually told me that she's just, that she's just, it was a problem. I stutter. So I eventually uh, it's just, um, it's just, I moved on, uh, and now like it's just, it's just, I'm based with a, just a major management company and uh, it's just, it's just, it's just a major lit agency. And it, it was super important to me that I signed with reps who understood me, and uh, just, I landed with fantastic people who uh, who just actually don't see it as a problem. So I very much have to stress, it's important for us to come out. I speak, I speak very specifically about just about our disabilities because it's not fair that like that almost everybody else is allowed to own their truth except us because it doesn't make people like because it doesn't make people feel okay around us. No, I don't. I don't think that's acceptable. And if we all come out, then I think it's just a major force for good. You are so right. Thank you so much for sharing. I myself had a quiet coming out um, where my outward expression of my bisexuality was wearing rainbow pajamas, watching Shit's Creek during quarantine. And I was bisexual and no one really had the chance to celebrate it or anything. So this is kind of more of a public opportunity for me now. But when I joined Respectability, it was a kind of different space. It was the first time I felt celebrated and seen and heard where I could come out not only about my sexuality, but come out with the long list that my therapist gives me every week and be proud of it and know that I have the platform to create change for people like me and help facilitate authentic stories because of it. So I just can't be can't even articulate how thankful I am for respectability for that opportunity and for being an organization that stands behind such strong values. 
Uh, does anyone else have a journey they'd like to share with disclosure and coming out with disability and, and queerness? I just want to quickly add that if you are not comfortable coming out and there's no rush, um, I feel to clarify, I think it's important that if you don't feel like coming out will be safe for you, um, don't do it. Um, but um, it's, it's, it's a process that everyone has to go through and you have to make your own decision um, and just know that you're valid regardless of whether or not you're out. And that's just, I just feel like that's important to say, so. I, I wanna follow up from Eric there just because I feel like the last three things that were said all really touch on sort of a similar issue for me, which is that I'm super passing both in LGBTQ space and in disability space, except for, you know, the 15% of the time where, you know, my disability makes that impossible for me to choose to be passing. Um, and so that's always been a really interesting line for me of when I'm choosing to disclose and when I'm not choosing to disclose, sometimes because it is a situation of, okay, if I tell them I'm disabled, I'm not going to get this job. But also sometimes it's a situation of, okay, I'm the person who's passing. So like Eric mentioned that he was bullied for this and that and didn't want to add on to his bullying. But because I'm passing, if I choose to embrace my passing identity, I can sort of bypass a lot of you know, these social stressors that come at me. But that also means that as a queer disabled person, I find myself in that invisible space a lot of what should I be doing? Should I be saying that I'm this person and claiming this space and this identity? Or is that taking away from somebody who is you know, going through a lot more stigma from having those identities? But just like what Shay was saying, I do think that even you know across the spectrum, as Eric said, be safe, you know your own life and your own uh, world and surroundings, but that somebody like me coming out as well and being very loud and proud about saying, hey, I'm this too. A lot of the issues that we get in the entertainment industry have to do with, well, what is the audience going to see? Or you know, what do the, the executives who are producing the show think that the audience is going to see in this character. So unless you have, you know, the white thin gay man who only wears rainbows and has a high pitched voice and, you know, all of these very, very basic stereotypes of what a gay man is, not that gay men can also be that, but that's a very classic stereotype. And then the stereotype of the disabled person, which is just, you know, the icon that you see on the bathroom, which is, it doesn't even matter who the person is, they're in a wheelchair and that's their whole identity. But that coming out wherever you are on that spectrum changes what the landscape of both disability and LGBTQ identity looks like. And that can change the way executives feel about things. It changes the way that audiences feel about things. And especially for other queer and disabled people, the more that you come out and say, hey, I'm here, that sort of gives other people the space to say, oh, maybe I can be myself and identify boldly wherever I am in the spectrum, so yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's, it's this balance of empowering others to come out and to, so that we can pave the way to make lives easier for the youth of today. And that's just so empowering. I just added the pronoun they, uh, to my name and that was a really awesome experience. I remember being very nervous about it and only doing it in the safe bubble of respectability and then the next day Amy Lovato announced her pronouns and I was like okay done I'm they like for sure I'm, this is an easy decision for me um, and so it was just such an awesome opportunity to feel seen and heard through that presentation and thank yeah. you all for being so vulnerable yes. Yeah, um, sorry. I just want to add on, like, I think, like, it's, uh, it's, uh, like uh, it's a good point to make about this is that if you look at something like Stonewall, it was always the people who couldn't pass, who were who were uh, already out there, she's, uh, she's invisible, who opened up uh, all, uh, all these doors and stuff. And I would say, uh, or uh, just, uh, just, um, just, I would hope that uh, she, if you are a person who can pass, that if you can stand out, uh, 
and, and then explain who you are, then it, it, it starts to it, um, just, um, just raises awareness that there are a lot of us out there. Agreed. Yeah, I think, um, you know, growing up in spaces uh, where it wasn't safe to disclose all of my identities. Um, we're getting to a point in history now where our stories are being sought after, um, which is great. Um, it's really exciting. We're not there yet. We still have so far to go, but the fact that major studios are seeking out writers and creators that occupy intersectional, um, you know, voices is, is huge. Um, and it's not always, you're not always going to be in an environment where it's safe to disclose um, to the people around you or to your office um, or even publicly. But just know that binaries are coming to an end. Um, people that occupy uh, LGBTQ spaces and um, the communities in disability communities that, that we occupy are actually like we're coming and we're coming strong and there's like there's nothing anyone can do about it so just you know keep yourself safe however you're keeping safe um, and hopefully we'll, we'll continue to build a world where it's safe for you to be you. Thank you so much for sharing that and your rhetoric is it gave me chills that binary is non-existent and the end of the gender regime is just one of my favorite topics ever so thank you for sharing such an insightful perspective and to everyone for being so vulnerable in this in this panel uh, I know that disability can take immeasurable amount of forms and per a question also in the Q&A I would like to acknowledge is uh, how can we navigate non-visible disabilities and what kind of stories do we want to see more of in our television and in our movies from a non-visible disability standpoint? And this can be from neurodiversity or mental health stories, but how can we offer more representation to this community that, like Kaya said, and like we've been talking about, that is passing? I'm happy to jump on again here to kick it off just because, so I'm, I'm a Spoonie. I'm somebody with a chronic illness, so an invisible disability that crosses over into a bunch of things, which as I said, are sometimes visible and are sometimes not. But as a Spoonie, I always thought it was incredibly interesting that one of the sort of very common types of shows is our hospital show, right? And yet we are not casting tons and tons of chronically ill people in order to play those roles. And we are not then putting chronically ill people behind the camera. We are not like, we don't utilize that space a lot. And again, I'm being focused here just since this is my own identity to talk about that space. So um, I think chronic illness is one of the invisible disabilities that sort of scares people the most um, because I think especially the nature of sometimes it's consistent and sometimes it's not is really terrifying to the film industry. Uh, so when dealing with invisible disabilities, I usually sort of have two things. One is, are you doing it because you want the brownie points of your general audience to see and understand this? Or are you doing it because it's the right thing to do, it's going to make your content way better, you're actually representing the community and authentic voices, and the community is actually going to see themselves in it as opposed to whoever's idea of what that person should look like is. Uh, and then the other thing being that a lot of times when we're talking about accessibility, that can just be as simple as flexibility, which is if you wanna cast somebody or hire somebody who has a chronic illness or some other kind of disability, which is a lot of disabilities that fluctuates and is one way on one day and is a different way on another day, then flexibility has to be a part of the way that you work accessibly. You have to be able to say, all right, I have this person who's doing this job. They're doing it fantastically. They are the authentic voice. I need to give them three days within a time frame where they're going to spend 24 hours doing X. Obviously, there are a lot of other sort of options for ways that you can make flexibility work. But I think flexibility and a def definitely flexibility with time is something that the industry is really scared of. So that's always a big push that I'm making. 
Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. That's just so awesome to hear. Does anyone else have any comments on passing or non-visible disabilities and maybe the kind of stories you want to be seeing on screen? Yeah, you know, I think um, our community, we have very unique experiences. Um, and those experiences are, are things that people can understand in any part of society in any part of the world. Um, so I think, I think the, I think the more people realize just how many of us are out there, um, and 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 the fact that we occupy all spaces. I mean, your neighbors, your colleagues, your family's colleagues, people inside your family, young and old. Um, we are everywhere. Our stories are everywhere, and um, our traumas are unique to us. Um, so the more our stories start to get folded into the storylines we see on screen, the more they start to normalize and the more um, stigmas start to dissipate because right now it's the stigmas that are keeping us from, from, from being part of society openly. Um, right now it's, you know, it's 25, between 20 and 25% of the U.S. is disabled. I think that number is much larger honestly. Um, I think people don't identify that way because there's so much stigma and heaviness around the fact that to admit that you're disabled or to admit that your body works a certain way, that there's some sort of um, shame in that and there's not. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I think that's a misconception a lot of times with the numbers is that there's for some reason are more gay people in America every year. That's just a right, huh? I wonder why. Maybe our country is getting a little bit more safe for everyone to disclose and come out. So thank you for acknowledging that. I think that's something people need to talk about more. Um, and I would also just side note that everyone listening, uh, like to invite the audience to ask questions of the panelists in the Q&A form. Uh, please add your question to the Q&A box on this platform. For our friends on Facebook, the comments are being moderated and questions will be shared on us on Zoom as well. Uh, so type in those questions so we can get to them and make sure everyone's voice is heard. And while we wait for the questions from the audience, I do have a question for all the panelists. Uh, what projects are you and your teams working on now that you are uh, moving forward in this pandemic cautious world? And, trying to get more involved. Uh, how can we help support your journey in whatever you're working on right now? Well, I think one of our favorite projects that we're working on is kind of on hold until it's safe to send children around the world again. Um, we do a, a show called Destination Conservation where we take teenagers and we send them out with wildlife biologists to the far flung corners of the world to work hands on with endangered wildlife, uh, bringing them back from the brink of extinction. But <laughs> with COVID going on right now, um, it's almost impossible for us to continue producing until the world is safe again. We can't put children at risk, even though we're putting them, we're, we're putting them with elephants and orangutans and tigers and what have you, we can't put them up against a virus. Thank you for sharing that project. Oh my goodness. Wow. What a show. Uh, and I know that post-COVID production is going to look so different from what we, what we saw before, but that actually transitions to one of the questions that we received is uh, how, um, how has COVID impacted the mental health space and entertainment? Um, does anyone want to take that question? I think it's an, it's an awesome topic because cinema and film distinctively have mental health intersections uh, and it's so, so empowering to talk about. So some of the work I've been doing with respectability um, is kind of exciting because 
we are seeing specific partners reaching out and asking us to consult on script projects um, that have neurodiverse characters embedded into the storylines. Um, and these are major studios that are looking for authentic representation. Um, instead of doing the project and then seeing how it lands, they're incorporating disabled um, consultants into the process of storytelling, which is integral to making it authentic. Um, and so I think that sort of gives us a peek into like the evolution of where we're going. Um, the more we see those storylines normalized on screen, the more we'll see more stories that way, the more people will start to come out, maybe teachers will come out, maybe people in leadership will come out so that it makes it, it makes it so that it's a safer space for all of us to really um, spread our wings wherever we're working. Thank you so much for sharing. And you're right, it's this idea of normalization that's really empowering right now where people are putting in their pronouns and their names so it's safe for me to put they or for someone else to identify uh, however they choose to. So I, I think that that's such a, an important aspect of our world right now is normalization. If anyone else would like to share uh, how neurodiversity and entertainment intersect or what stories we should be seeing. Well, I think coming out of the coming out of this year and a half long COVID nightmare, um, I think we need more stories of inspiration and more stories of of the changes that we can make in the world ourselves. Um, and stories of of empowerment where where we can overcome the massive oppression that COVID put on all of us. And I think that inspiration is necessary uh, for, for all of humanity, that we can get past this, we can move forward as a community, as, as humanity. Thank you so much for sharing. Oh yes, Kaya. Oh, I was just going to say to that point, just speaking about, you know, being in a post COVID world to touch on what Nazarene said and what I said a little earlier about, you know, although in the US, we might feel like COVID's over, we're moving on, we're doing our own thing now, especially as Lenny mentioned with his project too, if you're working with folks from all over the world, or if you're working with folks, even just from different areas in the States, really recognizing that we're not through COVID yet, and COVID isn't over. And even if, again, I'm in New York, we have some really low numbers now, you know, you can walk down the street and get a PCR test and get your COVID vaccination, you know, on the sidewalk. It's incredibly accessible for, you know, most people to make that happen and be safe and feel like they're ready to go back to work. But even just speaking about neurodiversity and you know mental wellness and things like that, one of the things we've been doing at Indie Visible is just as I mentioned, time, really giving people like ease and space to breathe and take rest when they need to. Everybody, please rest, rest and, you know, say, hey, I need to pause working on this. Can we come back to things? And just recognizing that, yeah, we have stuff that's in post-production now that's been in post-production for over the COVID year, but there's no, you know, there's no stress, there's no real reason why it needs to happen now, why it needs to get out now. And I think it's so much more important to prioritize the human element and prioritize your artists and prioritize your coworkers and just, you know, prioritize the mental health of everybody that you're working with. And I think in the long run, that gives you better product, it gives you better story, it gives you better everything. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's, I like the stories that when we see mental health, not as the plot line, but where it's, oh yeah, I go to therapy regularly, or it's taking medication on a daily basis. And these nods to a lifestyle of struggling with mental health, but also a lifestyle 
not separate from inspiration. Like Lenny was saying earlier, not separate from conquering all of the world. You know, it can be a superhero who is on Lexapro or whatever that might look like. Would be so awesome to see. Um, so thank you, thank you for sharing that. Um, let me see. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd love to, one of the projects I'm really excited about is a toolkit that I helped to create um, in collaboration with Respectability. Uh, one of the major studios commissioned us um, to really get into the details of what people need on set um, and what it looks like to make a universally designed and universally accessible set where everyone is welcomed. Uh, so we interviewed upwards of 25 people and really, and the people that I interviewed were a spectrum of people. So um, when I talk about disability, I mean like the entire spectrum of disability, not just um, someone who uses a cane, not just someone um, with chronic illness, but um, someone who's neurodiverse, um, someone with, you know, with migraines, the whole gamut. Um, so we, we created a toolkit that basically gives uh, set step-by-step -step instructions on how to make their environments universally designed. Um, and that's coming out hopefully this month. Thank you so much. That is such an awesome toolkit and I feel like will kind of fit everyone in the space. I have been doing consulting work too, where we help create authentic scripts for stories with uh, neurodiversity and mental health diagnoses in them, uh, which I feel like can also benefit so many industries and so many corporations and networks that are trying to produce diverse content, but to do it authentically. Uh, and that's kind of what's at the root of all of this is wanting to produce the most true and honest stories that we can that pioneer our communities forward and not backwards. Perfect. Well, it looks like we're nearing the end of our time here. So if anyone has any last things that they would like to say, I would like to close with a thank you to everyone and to our panelists and for such a lively discussion in the Q&A. Uh, I am so thankful to be part of this community and part of this process and sharing my story with everyone. Happy Pride. And the resources will be made available to you not only in the chat but when we send out everything the recordings and such so you can look forward to that in your inbox and thank you for registering